All right, we're talking about a pill to treat people exposed to radioactive material. There are two key concepts here, the pill and the radioactive material. So I'm going to start by the scarier one, this one, radiation, radioactive materials. Um, there is a lot of this thing out here. Um, we do use radioactive materials for a lot of different processes in industry, nuclear medicine, nuclear energy, in the laboratory for chemistry and biology research, and there's a lot of radionuclides out there in the environment in general. And last but not least, there are a lot of radioactive materials around here in the smoke detector in everybody's house. So it's not, it's really helpful in a way, more helpful than harmful when it's contained and when it's controlled. The bad thing is when it gets out of control. Um, so this image, you know, you have some kind of similar image in your mind when you hear radiation. And this is when you have a big cloud of particles that get spread around. And the danger is when people start inhaling or injecting radionuclides or radioactive particles. Um, this is an old picture. So you might think, OK, this is not relevant anymore. But in the past three decades, we've seen accidents. We've seen Chernobyl in the Ukraine. We've seen Guyana um, in Brazil. So Chernobyl was a nuclear power plant accident. Guyana was the mishandling of a cesium source in a decommissioned hospital. And Fukushima, of course, a few years ago um, that everybody's heard about. Again, a nuclear power plant accident after a natural disaster. So accidents happen and will happen again. And what we want to do is mitigate um, the hazards of radioactive materials that will be spread out in the environment. There are a few things out there that will help us. Um, so we, most people have heard of potassium iodide. It's um, to remediate radioactive um, iodine. There is something called Prussian blue that's um, to help with cesium, radioactive cesium. And there is even something called DTPA that will help with um, scarier atoms, elements like plutonium. And plutonium was invented or discovered at Berkeley. So. Um, that's one of the elements that we focus on um, in my lab, and we actually look at all those different elements highlighted here at the bottom of the periodic table. They're called the lanthanides and the actinides. They're F elements or heavy elements. Some of them are radioactive, always radioactive. Some of them can be or can not be radioactive, um, but most of them will be found in nuclear fallouts. And so we really want to understand the chemistry, the physical chemistry properties, the coordination chemistry properties of this element, so then we can seek them out if they were in a contamination event. And how do we do this? So we're looking at an element, a metal in that case, and we're designing molecules that will um, trap that metal and form a very stable complex that is much easier to get rid of when you have it um, internally. And so for the People who like chemistry out there, we're binding the metals through those oxygen atoms here, and we really form a very, very stable complex. So this is not only chemistry in the test tube. We do have to show that it works in vivo, because ultimately we want to develop a drug. And so we also have to develop models, animal models, um, to prove that this is going to work. And how do we do this? We inject animals with radioactive material, and so we have contaminated animals. And we do want to know where the radioactivity is in the body. Um, and to do this, we use some powerful tools. Um, and this is a very recent experiment that we've done at the synchrotron, the advanced light source that Musa described a little bit earlier. And here you have a schematic of a kidney. And on the upper image here, you have the image of the kidney of the mouse that was contaminated with uranium. But at the bottom, we take out the background, and this is where the uranium is. So all those shiny spots there is where the uranium gets. And this is the 3D reconstitution of that kidney. And so if we give a higher level of contamination, we see that the uranium on the right, all those golden spots, gets pretty much everywhere. So we know that we contaminate our animals. So once we have this, we give them the drug. And we hope that the drug is going to seek the radionuclide and get out. And so this is a very simple proof of concept experiment. We're looking at plutonium contamination of mice. And we're looking here at the percentage of the injected plutonium. The control bar here is our animals that were only contaminated. And so you see that about a little more than 40% after 24 hours is in the bones. That's the gray area. The red area is what's left in the liver. 
and up there in the tissues and in the kidney. So you have about 90% after 24 hours that's still in the body and it's getting stuck. But if we give them our drug, and in this case it was once, one dose, we can go from 90% to less than 20%. So that's a pretty dramatic um, reduction in body burden of the contaminant. So that's proof of concept. And this is where all the work starts. Um, in the pharmaceutical development world, to take a drug from the research bench to the market, you need about a billion dollar in 15 years. So hopefully we can do all this in much less time and for much cheaper. But our work now is focused on three different pillars, which, is, which are formulation, efficacy, and safety. So the formulation part gives, takes me back to the pill concept. We want to be able to give something to people in a nuclear event that's easy to take. We're not gonna hand out a bunch of needles and tell people to inject themselves. So we want to give them an oral pill, something that they can swallow. We also wanna make sure that you can also crush it if you wanted to give it to smaller children, elderly people who can't swallow pills. So we have to work on how we formulate our compounds or drugs. Then there's efficacy. We have to show that it's efficacious. Um, but we also need to know how effective our drug is. When do you give it? How long can you um, wait after the contamination? Do you have to give it within an hour or you can wait three days? Um, how long is the treatment gonna be? Is it gonna be only one dose? Can, do you need to take it daily for two weeks? When do you stop? So those are all the data that we get from our animal experiments. And I'm happy to say that the last part is to assess the safety in humans. Um, we're not gonna test the efficacy in humans because we're not going to contaminate people on purpose just to test our things. But we are going to want to know if there are side effects or if the drug is safe. And that's a very standard type of clinical trials. So we actually just received approval from the Food and Drug Administration about a month ago to start a clinical trial to assess the safety of one of our drugs. That's a good news. Um, and so we are hopefully getting a commercial product or a, a pill out there in a few years so that in the event of a nuclear contamination, we could use it. So this is uh, not something that one person can do. There are a lot of collaborations involved in this project and I can't list them all because I only have 30 seconds left. But there are a lot of people in this lab who work on this. It's really team science. It involves a lot of things from coordination chemistry to pharmaceutical development understanding, doing experiments with animals, with people. Um, it's a lot of work, but hopefully we can develop this very fast in a very cheap way and hopefully no one will ever have to use our drug. <laughs>